Welcome to PC Precision Engineering, a technical contract manufacturing and engineering solution provider located in the Western Hemisphere. We bring high-tech capabilities to the Dominican Republic for all of your outsourcing manufacturing requirements. Whether you are looking for a particular assembly or a complete product, we have quickly become a viable and competitive option to Far East locations. Looking for printed circuit board assemblies? Our capabilities include both surface mount and through-hole technology, including micro VGA for both single and double-sided placements. Cables and harnesses? We can assemble many varieties of cables and harnesses for all applications. We have sheet metal stamping and bending for enclosures. A full machine shop with CNC mills and lays, powder coat painting, silk screening, and metal plating operations. This allows us to package your circuit board and cables into a finished product, including final assembly and testing requirements. We can offer full turnkey or consignment inventory programs. Our goal is to develop a partnership that is best for both companies. We are flexible in our business options. We have seasoned engineering resources to finish your project or product and get them to market. We add value to our customers with our electronic, mechanical, manufacturing, and industrial process engineers. They make sure that your products are manufactured in the most efficient method and that your projects are completed on time. Quality concerns? We are ISO 9001-2000 registered with Underwriters Laboratory. We manage our processes and workmanship to MIL standard and IPC, and we are Rojas compliant. The Dominican Republic is perfectly located for your outsourcing destination with several advantages. Shipping is convenient to the mainland via both ocean and air services. You don't have to deal with such a drastic time zone difference for travel and communication, and all our staff is bilingual. The addition of DR CAFTA, the European Free Trade Agreement, and our location in the free trade zones in the Dominican Republic add several other advantages, including customs charges, duties, and taxes compared to other outsourcing locations. For companies located in the Dominican Republic, we bring the supply chain directly to you without cost of additional transportation. Let PC Precision Engineering assist you with your product and outsourcing requirements. Visit our website, then contact us for a tour of our factories and the beautiful Dominican Republic. And relocated to the Dominican Republic in 2004. Uh, was down there working as a contract manufacturer for a business and by 2007 I had taken over the majority share of the company. We have three facilities located in, in, on the island, one in Santo Domingo and two in Santiago. And uh, we do everything from electronic circuit boards, surface mount, through hole, and I'll explain that. Um, all the way up to building complete products that are shipped straight to distribution and into the, the appropriate markets. So a little bit about uh, where we're going today. I'm going to try to take you just through the overview of contract manufacturing, how we uh, work with small companies and large companies relative to building product for them, and also how we uh, do some value-added services as far as engineering, uh, a lot of you folks here may be inventors as, as I was reading through some of the information and a lot of times it's difficult to get started so I think that you may find it interesting that uh, possibly we could help in what we do. We are uh, very vertically integrated and uh, which means there's not a lot of other companies in the Dominican that can, uh, we can contract to so we do most of the work ourselves in house. We say that we're near shore. I, I guess that's all relative. A uh, little bit, little bit far away from the West Coast, but we do do most of our business primarily with U.S. companies on the East Coast, uh, Canada, and some in Europe currently. And uh, we are um, ISO 9001, 2008 certified, and I think we are very competitive as a low-cost outsourcing location. So we'll start the presentation. Just kind of take you through the process real quick. Uh, you know, I, I don't like to read the slides, so really we go from concept. Um, it depends on how far you are into your, into your product or your development of your product. 
Uh, one thing that is a little different, if you could provide a schematic, we could actually just take the schematic, uh, do, the, do the Gerber files, do the layout for you, and then take it into a fabrication of the circuit boards. From that, we would um, build prototypes, uh, typically go through a test process with that, and provided there's not a lot of changes, we could then start going into low volume production and ramp up as your product um, becomes more accepted in the market. Um, we do do, I'm gonna take this out. Um, so I said a little bit about prototypes. Depending on the complexity of the product, we will do um, different types of testing, different levels of testing, and can help even with the sales. Um, not really our strong point, but I'll talk to you a little bit about how we do that. Uh, if you want to really target Latin America and the Caribbean, I think we are a very good avenue to take uh, creative products into those markets. And, and I have a second presentation on that. Okay, well, what do we do? Well, we try to really make the transition from a concept product into the local market easy for you. So we go from different levels from many companies will just give us their documentation, their bills of materials, all the information, and we just quote it and build it. They tell us how many they want, they send us a purchase order, and we complete it. Um, if the product is not well defined, a, it's a little bit slower process. And if it's in the early stages of trial, proof of concept, there's a lot more trial and error. But uh, what we've done with several companies is help them through that early stage um, because it's a lot cheaper, we find, to do it with a, an offshore location where we can do engineering value add without paying super high engineering rates. So I think there's an advantage there for people. If the design is not frozen, and this is one of the frustrating things, I think, as we're all entrepreneurs and, and inventing things and trying to look at different things we can do, it can become a little bit risky in, in time and changes. And, uh, you know, in the manufacturing environment, sometimes we say, well, at some point you have to shoot the engineer so that you can get your product to market. They, they keep wanting to, well, let's change this feature and let's add this and let's do that and, and it goes on and on and on which typically burns time and it burns money so uh, a frozen design is better but it's not required um, is it really designed for manufacturing another area where PC precision can really um, add some value and assist you um, we get some products uh, there's a company that I just signed an agreement with um, that's doing some HHO type products and he was, uh, he's an inventor and, and he was basically buying some stuff and putting them together and making things work together and I says, well why don't you just design your own and we can write the software for you so you give us the specifications and we've taken his box which was a lot bigger and compressed it to one circuit board that does everything that he wants it to do and he was buying four or five different components and putting them together and making it work. But it was kind of a spaghetti's nest and it wasn't really uh, laid out for manufacturing. So we were able to help him with that. Um, what criteria to find the product is good? Okay? So how much testing do you really want? You know, what is required? Those are very important aspects to the specifications in engaging in contract manufacturing. Um, to be honest with you, I run my business without a lot of big contracts and so forth. Probably the most important is non-disclosure, which um, I think in the Western Hemisphere, and being that I'm a U.S. citizen and from the U.S., understand the importance of IP. Um, you know, a lot of people are scared to death to go offshore because there is, is pretty soon your product shows up with a little spin on it. and. Now you're spending time in, in the courtroom versus focusing on what you should be doing is, is developing your product and getting it to market. Um, so documentation again is important, but we can, we can help with that as well. 
or to manufacture. This is, you know, I was having dinner last night with my brother-in-law and he says, well, Mike, you're one of these guys that are moving jobs out of the U.S. Well, I guess that's, that's kind of true, but um, I decided to relocate to the Dominican with my family and, uh, you know, I think we have a good value to offer to, to U.S. businesses as well. Um, and that's where we do most of our, our work. We work for the, um, actually our facility is DOD for um, the U.S. Uh, we, so we build a, even some, some parts for the military. But you can, you can do it in your own facility and, and there's advantages to that. You control your IP, you control your manufacturing process, um, but you also have the cost of your own resources. Okay? And uh, you got to have the equipment and everything else. If you're going to go and contract manufacture, okay, you don't have the resources. A lot of uh, folks I've worked with, they're inventors and they think about once their product's ready to start their manufacturing side of the business. I'm going to start my assembly facility or whatever. It's, it's difficult and, and I think probably many of you ex have experienced that. Um, if you don't have the expertise, you have to find it. Um, so again, cost and time. And um, you know, so, so for outsourcing, you really avoid some of those uh, time and, and cost aspects of the business. Some trends that are uh, going on, and, and these are really uh, uh, just information, but uh, as most of you probably know, outsourcing's gotten real big, and it's probably why a lot of the jobs have, have moved offshore, and, and it's good to see that some of those are coming back home to the U.S., and, uh, you know, we, we, we um, really just try to provide excellent service to our customers and, and it's good. okay, you're okay, okay. Um, so there's, there's plenty to read about it, but outsourcing can be very different in today's market too. It, the involvement, the amount of work that, that you want done can vary. As I said, we go from building simple wire assemblies to building full products that we test complete and we ship straight to our customers, distribution, or customer. Some more uh, information, and, and these this, these presentations will be available. There's nothing proprietary to me on them. Um, so there, there's a lot of debate about you know the whole job thing and, and what's happening, but there there's still a lot of value to outsourcing as the the global economy is is really intertwined. We're even though it seems like I'm a long ways away and it was a long uh, flight and so forth, but uh, in reality we are four days by ocean shipment into Miami, and uh, which is which is pretty good. Your logistics cost and, and time and tying up capital becomes a part of the challenge in, in getting product to market in volume. So, you know, when you say offshore, well, we say nearshore because we're not too far in, in transit. So we can get into Miami in less than a week via ocean freight. We A lot of our customers today actually fly a lot of their products back into the U.S. and into Europe. Some benefits of uh, out contract manufacturing, as I said, less investment. And you don't have to buy the capital. If we, um, if we have the right capabilities, you utilize our equipment. Hey, we do primarily low to mid volume, kind of high mix type of products. I think very fitting to the folks in, in this conference here, because you, if you're an inventor or you have an idea or you, you have a product that you're looking to offshore, you don't have to do a million a month. You know, it doesn't have to be a consumer good that's sold in Walmart. In fact, I don't even quote um, a lot of consumer goods that go to the retailers, I think it's a very volatile market. They, and uh, we have companies that have come to me to say, can you build cell phones? I said, yes, but I don't want to because the technology changes every three months, as most of you know, with, with cell phones. So that's not really our business at PC Precision. What we do is we try to find good 
relationships with our customers and uh, it, we really consider it a partnership. Ramp up can be fairly fast. It depends on how well you're documented and how well you're ready to go. Okay? If um, we do two types of quoting typically, most of our customers we say do you have a timeline, then we quote it based on lead time to, to reduce lead time. So we can get some quotes to production in, in less than two weeks. Um, but other ones, they say, no, we strictly want it based on price. We go into the market and we say, well, you have a part on your bill of materials that has a 20 week lead time, you got a problem. Okay? So do you want to wait 20 weeks to get the best price? Do you want me to go find that part at a higher cost, but it's available or will be available in a shorter lead time? Okay? <laughs> Um, some drawbacks, you know, possibly uh, compared to in-house longer chain of, of command outside partner, a continued commitment to pull through with the contract, okay? additional transportation costs. We don't find that to be huge from where we're at, uh, but it is a con concern and perception of expectations, the culture and the language. I've lived there for eight years and I still can't speak very good Spanish, so, um, but we are most of my staff is bilingual, so most of them speak English, and all the professional positions and account managers do speak English. Some uh, additional benefits, economies of scale. We do two types of quoting today and two types of business. We do what we call consignment inventory programs, where if your company chooses to manage the materials and the logistics, they can send a kit to us and you will just, we will provide the labor to do the conversion to the product. Most of our customers will start that way. It's faster to move. They're gonna move a product from, say, Spokane to the Dominican. They wanna start quickly. They move it with the kit. We, we work out all the labor and assembly um, instructions, the documentation, and then we are ready to produce. So we'll produce, ship, qualify, et cetera. Typically transitioning into what we call a turnkey quotation or turnkey relationship. In a turnkey, they send an order that says, we need 100 of these and we buy all the parts to their specifications okay, and we do all the work, we just ship them the finished assembly. Um, as I, I mentioned in the introduction a little bit, we do have front end design work uh, that we offer. So I have about 14 engineers we do circuit board layouts, we do mechanical drawings, uh, we have companies that have come to us with literally a piece of paper and, and an idea and says, do you think we can do this? Um, I says, yeah, give me a schematic, we'll run the board, we'll build it, we'll create a prototype, and if it works for you, you can make changes and then we're ready to go. So the front end design is, is actually key to a lot of our, our customers because we get into the product much earlier. Okay. And when new generations are coming out, it helps us to be ahead of the curve. Um, again, when we do turnkey, we offer the whole purchasing, manufacturing, engineering. We have each, each customer has an account manager that is their contact person that's responsible for their account. Okay. Customer service, transportation, the logistics, we work all that out with the customer. Okay. It's less risk, I believe, for for the company to outsource uh, in, in some manners. And uh, really to, so you guys can focus on what's the next generation, what's the next product that you want to bring to market. Again, some requirements. We typically like to have things well documented, but typically in the entrepreneur world, that could go from anywhere from a napkin to electronic data and drawing. So we've seen both. Uh, there's a company out of uh, Connecticut and uh, they do professional audio equipment, which I, I think I read that John Bandini has a background in. And uh, he's actually a grand nephew of William Deming, the quality guru. And he brought his first design that we worked on together, literally on a napkin. He says, well, we got this concept I want to design this product, and now these products are being used in some of the top studios around the around the world um, for audio, professional audio. 
Um, talked a little bit about shooting the engineer, but product changes on the fly become very difficult to manage, so we try to avoid that. Um, you know, what are the expectations the, the, of the product and, and the ethics of the business? And, and we really, I focus a lot on that just because I, I think coming from the U.S., I, I understand what the expectations are, but it's better that all those are well-defined up front. And, and I mentioned partnership, but the mutual commitment. A little bit about the Dominican Republic. We do, um, you don't have to be real big to, to engage with us if you're interested. So, um, let's see, Honeywell, I guess, is a pretty big company. We, we serviced Honeywell for many years. Unfortunately, they moved from the Dominican recently and have moved to Mexico um, and to Asia with the work we were doing for them. We were actually doing it for an energy company. We were building the um, utility meters, submeters for a company called Emon. Some of you may know them. Emon Demon is their product. And uh, they were bought by Honeywell two years ago and have uh, gone through, I think, the whole big corporate bureaucracy of Honeywell making their decisions, but um, we move on, and, and uh, you know it's another customer that did very well for us. I think we did very well for them, and at the end there was no bad feelings when they departed, except I have to find more customers. So, um, but but those are big companies. Now we do a lot with small companies. We do, uh, like I say, this audio company. Maybe he does six thousand dollars a month in purchases with us, which is a pretty small number, but for him it's it's quite large for his retail market once he marks it up and resells it. So um, again said we we do low volume, high mix. Um, we don't focus really on the consumer high volume stuff. I think the good thing that we do do and probably what we score best with our customers today is responsiveness. Okay? Our ability to respond quickly in the market when people need things. So a lot of times what we're doing now is we may have a com company that's doing 80% of their volume in China and give me 20% and when they need something fast and they say, well, our China shipment's on the water, we're not gonna get it for four weeks, okay? Mike, can you raise your volume a little bit and get it on the boat to Miami and we can get that in two weeks? Yeah, no problem, we can respond. Um, we're not on the West Coast time, but, but most of the year we are on um, the same time as the Eastern time zone. And if you haven't been to the Dominican Republic, it's a great place to vacation as well as uh, do business. So quite, quite beautiful beaches down there. Okay. A little bit about my company. Again, bilingual, uh, except me. My Spanish is not very good. Um, we are located in what are called the free zones in the Dominican Republic. What is a free zone? A free zone, even though it resides in the Dominican Republic, has secured walls that the barrier to the customs is at the walls of the park. So the customs inspectors come to my factory every day, inspect the shipment, and when it goes on the UPS truck, it's already cleared customs. Okay? Inbound is the same thing. It gets, comes in when it enters the, the free zone past the wall, it's cleared customs. Um, the free zones in the Dominican Republic are tax-free, which means there are no taxes and duties on inbound raw materials. We do conversion of that material into product, and typically if the product is specified with the correct harmonized tariff code and going back to the United States and the value add is, is split correctly, uh, to duty and, and tax exempt, for the most part. Now it depends on the product and, and the cost of the product and the volume, but it's it's uh, as there's NAFTA between Mexico, Canada, and the U.S., there is a, a free trade agreement called DRCAFTA, which includes the Dominican Republic that is very similar in the rules and regulations of what's happening. Now if you have a, a product that you're gonna do some work in the DR, bring it back to the U.S., add value, you cannot go back to Mexico and add value and bring it back again. You can only go in and out of a, one of the NAFTA CAFTA free zones one time. And uh, I mentioned that just because people don't, 
if you don't understand it, what happens is at some point you're going to get a big bill if, if they find out you have crossed more than one free trade barrier. So I, I had it happen to a customer. It wasn't really, really good. So provide account management, um, strong engineering support, ISO certified. Today we are 9001, 2008. If you're in the medical field, for example, and you need 14385, or you're in automotive and you need an SAE uh, uh, certification, those can be applied for. We also build uh, UL listed products, so we have UL inspectors come in and do follow-up services at our facility in the Dominican Republic. Um, we have a stable workforce for the most part. Jobs are hard to find everywhere, so there are there are uh, pretty good loyalty um, to the company, so we're pretty lucky with that. And we believe we pretty much provide the complete solution. So look forward to be part of your solution, and I will be around today. I do have a another presentation, but I don't think I'm going to take you through the whole thing. I'm going to take you through a short one, okay? So let me take one second to change over here. Excellent. Um, myself and, and several of my uh, companies that I represent, um, opportunity and access to Latin America and the Caribbean. So I'm going to just give you kind of a case study. Um, right now, the energy sector is, is booming, uh, I think, globally, but in Latin America and in the Dominican, um, there are a lot of challenges. We pay, in the factories even, uh, probably about 19 cents a, a kilowatt hour. Residentially, we're paying in the low 30s, depending on how much you consume. Most of these developing countries and islands are being subsidized by the government, which is a huge amount of subsidy that goes into it. Um, so they're looking for solutions. And the resistance to um, penetration, as I say, into these countries can be very difficult if you don't have the right channels and you don't know the right people. So again, I give you a model of Ecuador. Um, and Ecuador is a difficult country right now because U.S. investment doesn't really want to recognize them as a safe investment country. But in Ecuador, they have oil. I'm sure most of you know they discovered uh, some fairly large uh, oil um, locations there, but they don't want to abuse it. They are really quite um, good at their environmental protection and so forth. So they have come to myself through my contacts and said, we want you to bring renewables to Ecuador. Okay? So I said, great, we can help you with the solar. We uh, have a solar inverter that we produce in our factory that you all listed. Um, it's a grid connect, one kW unit. They said, well, we want a big system. We want a megawatt, not one kW. I said, well, you can put a thousand of them on the roofs and you have one megawatt. They said, well, that's not a bad idea. But along with that, now they said, well, I go there and I say, well, what are you doing about the lighting? Okay? I mean, even here, right? You look at the lighting. This is not the most efficient use of light. LED lighting is taking off, and it is going to be part of all of our future. It's, it's just inevitable. The incandescents are going away. Um, Ecuador, like the Dominican, um, they give out the compact fluorescent light bulb. Well, it's great, but they got mercury in them. So now you got a problem where the government thinks they're doing a good thing. They give, they give out all these light bulbs to reduce the energy consumption, and they all end up in the landfill. Not real smart. So they said, okay, well, I have an affiliation where we're going to be manufacturing LED lighting. And we said, if you're going to want solar, you got to use lighting because you have to reduce your footprint. Using solar is great, but if you're still using incandescent light bulbs and, and not looking at your other aspects of reducing your, your consumption footprint, your air conditioning, et cetera, you're not gonna get as good a return on investment. So they said, well, great. We're interested in that too. Come present it to us. And I said, okay. Well, what else do you need? They said, well, 
we have vehicles that are producing a lot of pollution and is causing smoke and makes it dirty and everything else. We say, okay, well, we're going to bring in some HHO technology to go in and reduce some carbon emissions. Okay, great. We like that too. Okay, we'll put it in. What are you doing about your trucking and your oil? Well, I have another business that we do oil refinement okay, in line in the vehicles on, or on engines, which is a continuous refiner. And uh, we've gotten into some of the government's contracts and some of the big guys in Mexico that are putting them on every truck. Okay? Well, what does that do? Reduces their maintenance, reduces their oil consumption, improves their gas efficiency, improves the um, long-term reliability of the engine parts. Okay? They say, great, we'll take that too. So any product like that that can help with the environment, help with CO2 emissions, help with energy efficiency okay, is very viable to get into Latin America, the Caribbean, South America. And what I've tried to do is bundle it. And it's one of the exciting things about being here and speaking is if any of you have a product that you believe it works well and is mature enough and you need representation or manufacturing, that's really why I'm here to try to present that opportunity to you. The, the taking it to market um, would be bundled in with the other companies that I'm already going in and representing and selling. So it's not with everybody, but with most companies, what we typically do is, is my first question is they say, well, Mike, we'd like you to make this in the Dominican Republic. I say, great, we, we want to do it for you. So they say, great, quote it, they like the price, so we start the relationship. And I say, well, how many are you selling in Dominican? I've never seen this here. And they say, zero, we don't have any representation. How about other parts of Latin America? No, we're just selling in the US. I say, that's fine, okay? I'd like to represent your product in the Dominican and in Latin America, and what I do is I bundle it. So when I go in to present to a government or to a distribution network or to a company, I, I say, well, we have a full lineup of energy efficiency products. We have a full lineup of services, and it's a it's a nice way to get into the market. And uh, a lot of that is also working the public sector. So you know you have to have, unfortunately, in, in Latin America, for the most part, you have to have connections to get into the the public sector. But once you're in, hey, it can be very promising for you because they say, well, we're going to put LED lighting in all the government buildings. Okay. Well, that's a pretty big contract. We're going to put solar on all the government buildings. Okay. We want to do something with HHO in all the vehicles or all the, all the public buses. Okay. So there's a lot of opportunity in being able to bundle anybody's product as long as it kind of fits the mold. Okay. Yes? Yeah, I'd like to know <laughs> Yes, we do. We do a micro BGA and we do BGA. We have X-ray. Um, you can find our corporate presentation on the website as well, and it gives all the specs of the, the spacing of how small we can go down to. My, my real question is, out of all the products you make, which is your favorite one? Um, well, Today I'd have to say our new product that's about ready to launch this grid tie um, solar inverter is probably the one I, I've had the most interest in. I actually have been in the inverter industry for since 85, so um, believe it or not I actually was doing solar in the, in the late 80s with uh, backup systems and there was a lot happening here in, in, the, in Washington out in, uh, I can't even remember the little city there, but a lot of there was a lot of migration coming into the Northwest out of California for the end of the end of the time, I guess. And people were building bomb shelters and wanting backup power systems. And and uh, the company I worked for was called Heart Interface out of uh, Federal Way in Kent, Washington. And um, you know the the owner inventor from from there is now living in Costa Rica, and he's still developing inverters. So 
it's been kind of a, an interesting race of, of the whole inverter segment, but uh, we have a very interesting 1KW grid tie unit, but it can also be used for rural electrification. And uh, it was kind of built around our ability to penetrate the Latin American market. Does that answer your question? Great. Next. Uh, yeah. Um, Marsa. Currently today, we build um, mostly for backup power supply, uh, backup power. Another thing great about the Dominican grid, we have blackouts every day, um, sometimes several times a day. And you know, and, and looking at what John has done with the Tesla charger and things like that, this is where you want to talk about the market penetration. Millions of batteries are brought into the Dominican every year. Okay? Most of the distributors, hey, and this is part of the barrier to entry, are making a lot of money on selling replacement batteries. So they, the, those guys making the money, they don't want good charging, they don't want good recycling, good rejuvenation of the batteries. They want them to go, go, be perceived to go bad and sell replacement batteries. Hey? Huge market. There's probably in service today, I would say, um, probably over a million backup power inverters running on batteries in the Dominican, if not more. Um, but to answer your question, we build a small series of, of products for a company called Trace International. That they came out of Washington State here, uh, was a break off from Hard Interface back in the late 80s and uh, became Trace Engineering. I don't know, some of you I'm sure would know who they are. They were then bought by Xantrax, and um, now they're owned by Schneider Electric, and that's the companies I came from. But uh, to answer your question, we go up to 3KW in a, in a modified sine wave version, a square wave, and all the units we are producing today are inverted chargers. Okay? The grid tie unit we do, the largest today, is 1KW. We're gonna probably push it up to 3KW, um, but that market starts getting tough because what was the average size of the homes in the U.S. requirement? 3KW. Every inverter company in, in around went after that particular sector. So um, where, where we're at, 1KW is, is quite adequate for a high percentage of the, the consumption usage. Okay? Other questions? Yeah, do you do patent work and stuff like that on a product? Patent work? Do we do patent work? No, we don't, but, but if you wanted to, I actually do have a patent attorney that I use. Um, they are in the U.S. Um, I just, I've, I can give you a little brief experience. In the last uh, couple of months, I was taking one to a provisional patent, and we didn't actually go beyond the provisional at this point in time because the internet access to technology and everything is so fast, it's, it's really difficult. And, Fortunately, or maybe fortunately, the patent attorney I use is extremely expensive. So I said, look, at it. I'm not going to chase this one. So it, it depends on what you really need. But if you needed assistance, I can help you with that. But it's not really what we do. If you have patented product, then typically that's just protected by non-disclosure. And, and we protect your IP um, in, in different fashions. It depends on the level. Like we, because we build for the Department of Defense, um, we actually cannot have foreign nationals from third-party foreign nationals even have access to the documentation. So here I got a professional from Ecuador working for me. Well, he has to have separate um, protection against what he can access in my company relative to the documentation and so forth. Any other questions? I'm about out of time here, so. Uh, just one more. Uh, Asian markets, what's your expectation there? Um, I, I, for me personally, I look at the Asian market as a huge emerging market, but I also look at it as a pretty difficult market to enter as well, just because it's so far away, for, at least for me. So really my focus is in the Caribbean, in Latin America, South America, um, where we have our strengths. And actually, if you look at that market for the type of things we're doing, um, it's a very large market. People don't realize just the islands are 40 million people. I mean, in, in just the islands. So 
there's a, a large market there with an odd lot, a lot of the islands don't have a lot of resources and so forth to, to bring solutions from their own area. So they look to the larger islands or they're importing. And you know what we've tried to do is bring the manufacturing and the strategy closer to the marketplace itself. Now, to be honest with you, we compete with China in contract manufacturing, but in a different way just because we don't go after the, the high volume stuff. And, uh, and we're a little unique in the fact that because I really enjoy it, it's my background that we focus kind of in the energy sector uh, with a lot of our relationships and, and helping bridge that gap into these, these Latin countries. Yeah, time's running out. One more question and then uh, I'll be around in, in today, so if people want to speak to me and I have some brochures over there. Yes? Uh, there, with, there are 3D uh, inkjet prototypers that are coming into uh, fruition now at a very reasonable price, like a thousand bucks. What effect, uh, impact have you seen with these devices or can you foresee with uh, presenting a new product? Well, they really speed up the, the prototyping process. They, there's good ones out there and there's some that are kind of like what I call hobbyist stuff. Um, we have them available to us in the Dominican. I have a couple of companies that have the equipment, so if we want to rapid prototype something, we can. I actually have very good access to a couple of the universities and, and uh, higher education facilities in the U.S., Virginia Tech, as well as uh, Western Carolina University. They have a very nice rapid prototyping center. It just depends on what's required. Um, but they work very well, work very well, and really give you a good feel of is your product concept and design laid out properly, okay?